If you've been following the news, you see that the World Health Organization is now saying that they have vastly underestimated the Ebola outbreak. Vastly is their word, not mine. This may also mean that they have vastly underestimated the potential for seeing this disease spread to other countries in Africa and to other countries in Europe. Up until a few days ago, they were saying that the Kenyan airlines that were still flying into Sierra Leone were a potential problem. Now that has stopped. But if you do a little research, you're going to find out that Kenya is a jumping off place to India. And of course, India is a jumping off place to North America because of all the IT work that's being done over there these days. One piece of good information that came up from the article was some discussion about what they are doing to treat people who have Ebola or who are thought to have Ebola. Basically, what they say is that they're just providing supportive care, which includes uh, replacing bodily fluids that are being lost and also giving antibiotics to prevent the arrival of opportunistic infections. And then they say that for the rest, they're just hoping that the person's immune system will be strong enough to fight off the disease. And I think that this is a major clue about what we can do if Ebola begins to emerge within the United States. The key concept for any viral illness has to do with the viral load, the amount of virus in your body. A high virus count, a high virus load, means that there are a lot of viruses in your body and that's what makes it hard for your body to fight off the infection. Whereas with a low load, you are better able to fight um, the infection through your immune system. And that's why it's important to look at the other video where I talk about using plant materials to help your body keep down the viral load. Just to recap, they say that the tobacco-based serum has three enzymes in it, one of which tells the tobacco plant that an infection is present in the plant and the other two which stop the replication of the virus. And we can safely assume that other plant antiviral compounds will do similar sorts of things. We do know for a fact that there are other plants that have been tested for antiviral properties. One of these is garlic, which has the compound allicin in it, which is an antibiotic and quite possibly an antiviral. I would certainly think of it as an antiviral because garlic is something I take when I get a cold and I feel that I get better faster. Another item that comes up very high on the list is oil of oregano. It turns out that oregano has a compound called carbacrol, which has been used in some lab tests uh, and seems to show some results. For instance, a small test was done uh, in petri dishes showing that carbacrol could reduce the growth of staphylococcus bacteria. And there was also another test where uh, they gave mice a lethal dose of staph bacteria and the ones that were given the carvacrol survived. Now I realize that I'm talking about bacteria here, uh, but it's also true that for many years people have been using oil of oregano to treat all kinds of infections, and many of them would have been viral infections. So once you've done what you can to hold down the virus count, the viral load, the next piece you need to take care of is helping your body kill off the viruses that remain. And your body does have mechanisms for doing this in the immune system. One of the main parts of your immune system that does this kind of work are the white blood cells. Having identified the white blood cells as a major source of virus killing capacity, the question comes, how do we promote our body's ability to produce enough white cells to take care of the problem? And it turns out that there are four vitamins which are really crucial to keeping the white cells functioning and growing. Those are vitamin C, vitamin A, folic acid, and vitamin D. In order to save you time and help you increase your odds of survival, here are some of the sources for these four vitamins. For vitamin C, guava, red and yellow peppers, dark greens such as kale, kiwi, broccoli, various kinds of berries such as strawberries and blueberries, citrus fruits, tomatoes, peas, and papaya. Now with vitamin A, we need to start by saying that with vitamin A there is some risk of toxicity if you take too much of it, particularly in the animal forms. 
In years past, people thought that 25,000 units a day was an okay dosage, and now, according to Dr. Wild's site, they tend to feel that 15,000 units is the maximum amount you would want to take under normal circumstances. And Dr. Wow recommends that as much of this as possible should be in the form of mixed carotenes. Carotenes are the chemicals that make various things like carrots and peppers have a bright color. And you can buy carotene supplements. And he basically says that from the carotenes, your body will make as much real vitamin A as it can handle and dispose of the rest. Having said that, there are a number of good vegetable sources of carotenes, and these include sweet potatoes, carrots, dark greens again, such as spinach, squash, romaine lettuce, apricots, cantaloupe, sweet red peppers, and probably yellow peppers, and mango. Folic acid can be obtained in the form of supplements, but the natural sources are beans, lentils, raw spinach, asparagus, leaf lettuce, avocado, broccoli, mango, and oranges. For vitamin D, fatty fish such as salmon, sardines, and tuna are good sources. You can also buy vitamin D3 supplements. Also remember that your body can make vitamin D as a result of sun exposure, and of course we've had a lot of cautions in recent decades about overexposure to the sun, but if you do some research, um, you can find out about some ideas about safe exposure to the sun. Just go for a 15 or 20 minute walk, you know, and expose as much skin as you can. That's probably not a big problem. The best time to take care of any disease is before it occurs. And that's why you want to do things like proper nutrition and so on in order to keep your body immune system in condition. Uh, one problem with Ebola is that some of the symptoms are vomiting and diarrhea, which means that if you wait until you get sick, you may have a hard time keeping stuff down or getting stuff down in order to make yourself well. So prevention is definitely high on the list. As far as good news is concerned, I was watching something on BBC and it was a video by an African man who had Ebola and survived it and is now spending his time going around to villages talking to people about their possibilities for surviving Ebola as well. I was watching a very interesting interview with a guy named Robert Scott Bell who has a website he was saying that the test used for Ebola and other viral illnesses is actually a very bad test, very imprecise, and cannot be trusted. So it may be that the actual rate of Ebola infection in Africa is being overrated. You're talking about a very poor population that lives in unhygienic conditions, has bad water to drink and poor nutrition, and it's quite possible that people with some of the symptoms of Ebola are being mixed in with people who have real Ebola and that's how the actual infection is being spread. So what can I say in conclusion? I think that as a result of my investigation into all of this because of my own self-interest, I feel like the situation is not as hopeless as it might have seemed a few days ago. Certainly there is some level of risk and we're waiting to see for the actual facts on the ground which will be based on seeing cases emerge in the United States, if any, how many, how fast it spreads, where it spreads, and all that kind of thing. If you don't see anything, then we can more or less go back to sleep. But if we do see something, your life will depend on being awake, staying awake, and taking action.